actually that is incredibly damaging to the living world. George, welcome. Welcome back to the Bali again. We just watched uh, an excerpt from the film, not the entire film, but maybe if you can, um, yeah, share with us what you think, how does the film demonstrate the, the past mistakes we've made as a society to you? Well, uh, it's a really great thing that this film is out. I mean, at last, we are challenging the bucolic, romantic image of farming, particularly low productivity farming which we've fetishized for years. Our food writers, our celebrity chefs, our television programs, they love farming that produces hardly any food. Mm -hmm. That's what they really love, you know. Oh, look look how pretty it is. Look, you know, there's, there's, um, there's a few cows grazing in the meadow and, and it looks like the storybooks. That's Quaint, what they want it to look. It's rural. That's what people are looking for, that, because, because what about half the books for very young children, like pre-literate children that, that they're exposed to, are books about livestock farms. Mm. One cow, one pig, one horse, one dog, one cat, one duck, one chicken, all, all talk to each other. No idea why they might be there. <laughs> what they might be <laughs> up to. What's happen to them. <laughs> yeah. And, and so the livestock farm is promoted as this, this place of comfort and safety. Whereas, actually, it's the most horrendous place. I mean, I worked on a pig farm when I was a teenager. You did? Yeah, and, and, and throughout every day, every day, there were two, two questions, or two thoughts which went through my head. The first was, this isn't what they told me farming was about. Because you remembered all those yeah. child, and the childhood second, stories? The second was, why is this legal? Yeah, because if we treated dogs mm -hmm. like we treat pigs, we'd be sent to prison. It's as simple as that, you know, yeah. we, we, uh, and there would be a horrendous scandal. You know, if someone had packed thousands of dogs together in a vast factory and they were rolling around in their own shit and they were being kicked around and then they were being slaughtered, you know, they, they would have, there would be a massive public outcry and there'd be a long prison sentence as a result of that. How, how strong is that, that, that cultural power? So, so my sense, and this is what really hit me, particularly doing the research for Regenesis, is that cultural power is more, is greater than economic power. That, you know, all my life I've been talking about economic power and the threat it presents to democracy and the threat that it presents to our life support systems. But actually, you know, I've always had this question in my mind, why are farming and fishing so powerful? Because mm -hmm. they're comparatively small, small industries. Small industries, yeah, relatively. Yeah. And it's a cultural power. Which, 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 which renders them so powerful. And so you, you have um, that cultural power constantly reinforced by these children's books, by the television programs, but also by myths going back thousands of years, particularly about grazing animals. Right. Your, 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 your biggest antagonist, sheep, for example. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, the, the, the Old Testament was written by people whose ancestors had been pastoralists, had been grazers. Um, and, and they look back with nostalgia. Even they were romanticizing that life. And they were the good people. The tillers of the ground were the bad people. Cain was a tiller of the ground who slew um, Abel, a, a herder of beasts, the beloved of God. Um, and this um, tradition then was carried on into the New Testament. Jesus was... The Good Shepherd, good shepherd yeah. and Agnes Day, the Lamb of God also. Look at that staff he's holding. It's a crook. It's still the crook, the pastoral staff. The pastoral Western, staff, yes. In, in the Western Church, is still the shepherd's crook. He's a pastor, which means shepherd in, in Latin, but also, of course, come to mean sheep, uh, priest. Uh, mm -hmm. so, um, yeah. they, are, they are frighteningly similar sometimes, yeah. yes. And, 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 and these, so these traditions are very heavily embedded. And so what we do... When we look at a farm landscape, we say, does it look like the stories? Does it look like the stories we saw as very small children? Does it look like that? Mm -hmm. does, does it look like... Does this fit um, the myth? That's right, exactly. And if it does, we love it, and we say we want that. And if it doesn't, we hate it, and we, we, we revile that. Right. But actually, that is incredibly damaging to the living world because it's agricultural sprawl. It sprawls across vast areas of land to produce not very much 
food. And every hectare of land which is used for extractive industries, however low yielding, is a hectare of land which cannot support wild, self-willed ecosystems. And the great majority of the world's species, as Andrew Bamford was saying in, in the film, depend on wild ecosystems. Yeah, they're specialists. Time. Every hectare of land we use has an ecological opportunity cost and a carbon opportunity cost, because wild ecosystems are always richer in carbon than the extractive systems with which we replace them. And so if you've got a system which invokes massive agricultural sprawl and, and livestock grazing sprawls over 26% of the planet, which is more than all other human land uses put together, then you have a system which has got a massive impact on nature. It looks pretty to us because it conforms with those old myths exactly. and pictures in the books. But actually, it's devastating for nature. 